In this episode of Costumous Character, I spoke with Deborah L. Scott about her work on Avatar The Way of Water. We talked about practical and CGI costume design, nudity, and how being underwater changes basically everything. If you want more Costumous Character videos, don't forget to subscribe. interesting that we're almost that we're doing a video about this film because so much of what we talk about is how costume influences character and obviously the <laughs> a lot of that comes down to the actors wearing the costumes which obviously wasn't really happening in this film however there's actually moments where the actors did get to wear the costumes and uh deborah told us a really interesting story particularly about sam worthington and a mesh sort of tutu for the most part when actors came in if the designs weren't completed they were they were on their very much on their way to getting there mm -hmm. so J jim would show them and i would show them i'd show them samples of things that we were making and they got a real education so kate in particular mm -hmm. um and she was new to the process and the kids were new to the process the mm -hmm. kids it was amazing to me that the kids could put all that stuff on right the, i mean yeah. those kids never worked with a head rake they didn't yeah. understand, even understand the concept. So there was a little bit of rehearsal time. And for most of them, I mean, dry and wet, also on, on dry land, it mm -hmm. was very important. We would we took, had two days where we took all the children, dressed them in loincloths and, you know, so that they could run around and right. jump over things and do, you know, their bowing, all the things they needed to do so that they could sort of, as an actor innately, right because they weren't going to be able to wear the costumes fully right. for character, as you know. When working with CGI costume design, one of the things that we've talked about um, in past videos, particularly with Moon Knight, is a sort of savviness on the part of audiences when it comes to the way costumes look on screen. Now we talked about the criticisms, uh, I think we mentioned in the previous uh, video, the Thor helmet as an exam example of when bad costume CGI is really glaringly obvious. Now with Avatar The Way of Water, uh, Deborah was very keen to make sure that everything looked as grounded and real as it could be given that they were working within a CGI media. One of the ways in which that really comes through is with the use of color. Now color signifies things for audiences in, in any film, um, and particularly with Avatar The Way of Water, you have it distinguishing the two sort of Navi tribes you've got the the forest people and the water people and the way that they use color and material differs because they live in different environments she mentioned to me that one of the kind of color palettes she was inspired by was a sunset and deborah mentioned that she could have tweaked them but decided not to so we did a tremendous amount of studies with color and and you can find this on the internet practically when you go to depth mm. how color what colors and how colors change right and right. at a certain point, pretty much everything loses it, right? right. It just right. becomes basically. There's no light, you get no color. <laughs> yeah, it's like you got black. But yeah. then, which kind of annoyed me at first, you know, because there were a couple of costumes, and if you're talking about some things I might do differently, mm. I would, it would, there would be some things that I would maybe change the color of, mm. but only because, and then I had to accept the fact, like, Kiri dives down, mm. Her top's kind of mostly red beads or mostly natural. The forest people were challenging because they didn't have the brilliant colors. Right. right? The, so they, she has a lot of red and there's a lot of brown and she dives down and it comes, the costume becomes quite dark, quite right. black. You can still see the detail of all the mm -hmm. pieces, mm -hmm. but you, you lose that color. Mm -hmm. And I would go, Ugh, you know, and like, well, should we manipulate it or not? Mm -hmm. And Jim was like, absolutely not. You're not manipulating right. anything. But when she would come back up to the surface, the, you know, you would yeah. once again get the color. So it was an, an, it was an interesting kind of just narrative to kind of go mm -hmm. with. I thought it was really interesting that Deborah decided not to tweak the colors because in a way that really helps ground the film in reality. And that is so important for a film like Avatar, The Way of Water, and also the first film because it's such a fantastical story and it's obviously almost entirely CGI and medium that it has to feel real because the message in it is a very real and potent one about environmentalism, about protecting the planet, about biodiversity and eco-diversity. And for that to really resonate, the film has to feel grounded in a reality that we can relate to. 
Why do you come to us? I just want to keep my family safe. When you look at how costumes are designed specifically for a CGI film like this, it's a very different process to what we've been talking about in most of our series in terms of how costume informs character. With Avatar The Way of Water, a lot of the work that Deborah had to do was about researching how fabrics and materials moved and looked both in terms of uh, their texture and color underwater. One of the, uh, I think, most interesting moments was the cape that Kate Winslet's character wears. Uh, it's like, almost looks like it's made of metal. It's very, very beautiful. And that is gonna move underwater very differently to uh, something made of rope or hemp. Kate in the water was interesting because we shot another thing that didn't appear in the movie, but is going to maybe be in the, the next sequel is, um, you know, doing a tremendous amount of tests with with divers and mm -hmm. then Kate under the water, mm -hmm. carrying thing, you know, carrying the, like do, using this Kate thing. And the weight was really important. Mm -hmm. How it floated was, it was a lot, it was, you know, probably weeks and weeks of testing to get mm -hmm. just the right thing so that it moved correctly, mm -hmm. but also that a person could actually handle it. So obviously this is a big challenge when doing costume design, but it also presented some sort of uh, unexpected benefits. Because they're all handmade and bespoke and individual, the the good thing about most of them is that you didn't have to make a duplicate, right? So you could get you could do whatever you wanted. It didn't you didn't have to worry about repeating. Right. So it opened up for the 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 team that were the makers, and that was mostly um, my team at Weta Workshop in New Zealand. So they we would set a foot to do something and you didn't, you could do it as complicated, as individual as you want it because you didn't have to duplicate it. The duplication was going to come from the, the CGI artist, the right. digital artist. The concept of being back in the water with him was one, was twofold. Once you knew it was going to have, every costume was going to have expected motion. Mm -hmm. And that motion, although up to the animators, was really important to prove in concept to Jim. Mm. So we would we made replicas of everything that went in the water and shot extensive testing. Right. Um, and also to inform the animators and the simulators because they don't know those, again, those costumes being so bespoke and particular and unique, mm -hmm. they don't have a program that says, okay, how does flax and beads and this kind of hemp and these float in the water? Right. How does that, they, they're, they don't have that brain yet in their machinery. One of the conversations around Avatar, The Way of Water, but also the series in general, is uh, James Cameron's use of symbols and signifiers from various indigenous cultures without necessarily paying respect to the specificity of what those things mean. In my conversation with Deborah, I did bring this up because I think it is a very interesting point from a design perspective about when inspiration crosses that line into appropriation. I I haven't read that much of the conversation mm. about it in response. I know that, you know, it's always a consideration. Mm. Jim, you know, again, he's he's a he's a world traveler. So he's and he's very invested in indigenous cultures and with mm -hmm. the environment and things like that. Um, we did extensive research and the research was worldwide. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the tattoos and things like that, which are a little touchy to some people, mm -hmm. you can look at Maori. You can also look at tribes in the Antarctic, mm -hmm. you know, the Arctic off of China, off of India, who, who use the same kinds of body art to express their cultures. Okay. So in the research, like for me, once you sort of research things that are, and Jim's an absolute, dedicated to research. Mm. We spent months doing research. We would go back to the research every time we would do a new costume or alter it or, or in any way. And sometimes he would find an image that he really liked. And then it was like, okay, how are you going to use that mm. with respect, mm -hmm. you know, and know that the imagination of peoples all over the world sometimes come in a collective, right? Mm -hmm. So you would, as soon as you start finding like, oh, that tribe does this, this tribe does, these people do that, 
it's like you're like okay that's that's not only sort of untouchable in a weird way but also a touchstone in another right. way so right. he he doesn't want jim's not a lover of sci-fi you can right. see in all of his movies they're all even the live action costumes mm-hmm. all the things we did are very grounded in what reality tells mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. and that's our reality mm-hmm. right our reality is humans living on the planet now mm-hmm. um as soon as you then you as you open that door to the the fantasy and the imagination of the world you're not only placing yourself in there to use your imagination dictated mm. by what people on Pandora might think or you know so it it's it has its confines and it also has its openness mm. with avatar the way of water and with a lot of films that take inspiration from indigenous cultures there's always a risk of sort of further marginalizing and demeaning the communities that you're taking that inspiration from indigenous communities are are some of the most impacted by the things that are going on with the planet. It's similar almost in conversation to the live action Aladdin film in the way that people are inspired by these seemingly exotic and mythical cultures and worlds, but the lens through which you're doing that research is still one of of distance. And so you end up with this there is a level of appropriation there because you're taking symbols from across various different indigenous groups and then you're compiling them into something new and it's only going to work for you if it does as an audience member as an individual audience member you get to decide whether that works for you or doesn't um but i think it would be disingenuous to talk about the design of this film without bringing that up as being an issue i think most importantly we have to remember that none of these movies ever exist in a vacuum. And so while you might want to look at Avatar The Way of Water as a, a its own thing, especially because it's a fantasy, it still exists for us in the world and, and in a society that has for a long time oversimplified, stereotyped, and marginalized groups in a way that it has been historically hugely damaging. Treat them as our brothers and sisters. An interesting element of the costume design that I hadn't actually thought about until Deborah mentioned it was the use of nudity in the design. And it reminded me of a conversation that I had with Phoebe DeGay about the English, where she talks about how um, the trousers that were meant to be worn had this big slit and you were gonna see a lot of leg and so they toyed with what they could and couldn't kind of get away with while still being true to the very real Native American people that they were representing. Um, a similar conversation took place with with Deborah because as we mentioned the costumes for the Navi were inspired by various indigenous cultures and again we're sort of t- stepping into that conversation again about the use of other cultures costumes in a kind of fantasy setting. In terms of the nudity, it's it's quite interesting because that was a bigger preoccupation for the design than I would have thought watching the film. Because when you watch it, you don't really think about it, which goes to show you that I, I think they did a good job balancing those things. He didn't want that. He didn't want us to be, to have to fight that, that to jump over that hurdle. Right. So, you know, we worked very hard to come up with this, uh, you know, as, as much sort of asymmetry right. as, you know, to, to so that you weren't looking immediately at the costume and going, oh, that's a bathing suit. Right, right. So it was hard. I hope that it was mostly successful. I'm sure there are, you know, people out there that are criticizing that. Mm. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, it was very much considered and decisions were made around that that mm. that I felt I felt pretty good about. Mm. A very sort of obvious way that you can see that the film has this uh, sort of conversation around nudity is that the character of uh, Quaritch and the other sort of humans that have been uploaded into their avatars, they still dress like people. They still wear full, you know, kind of combat fatigue. 
So they're bringing their human, you know, Western sensibility about what is appropriate to dress like to these new bodies that don't necessarily need or warrant that. The film itself is sort of making points about how we dress as people or Navi or whatever um, by choosing to put these characters in these costumes. And then you also have Jake's sort of adopted son who is still human but lives with them and sort of is in this kind of halfway house in terms of the clothes and sort of the breathing apparatus things that he wears. So you see how the design does still have these moments of um, character distinction that you'd expect of a more kind of traditionally filmed movie, even if that sort of takes a backseat to some of the other grander CGI elements of design. We cannot let you bring your war here. That's it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to like the video. It really helps us out a lot. And if you want more Costumous Character, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.